All right, welcome to our third episode from Evolution 1, and this is going to be part one of Darwin's theory. We're going to go over how, how he kind of came towards his theory of natural selection. So first I want to start off with, what is a theory? Now we had this in an earlier screencast, but it's, it's a very important concept, so I want to go over it again. A theory is simply a hypothesis with lots of evidence. So there's a lot of data to back it up. Now, your textbook uses it as a statement that unifies many related hypotheses. You can put them under one theory. Your textbook also uses a concept of a well-tested explanation, which is basically a fancy way of saying a hypothesis with lots of scientific evidence. So a theory in science is a very, very powerful statement. It truly means something. It, it's it's something very concrete. Now, evolution, as we had on an earlier uh, podcast before, it's a change in the genetic makeup of a species over time. So what you're doing is you're seeing the genes change in a certain set of organisms over time. And it can actually lead to a series of new species. And we're going to learn the mechanisms of how species are created when we get to our Evolution 2 series of screencasts. All right, now... Darwin, when he got back from his trip on uh, the HMS Beagle, he had this concept of evolution kind of floating in his head. And he was starting to write out basically his, his paper or his report or his book on that. But he kept it under wraps for 23 years before he let him know or let the world know of his great idea. Why did he wait so long? Well, these three things on the screen. He knew it would challenge the fundamental scientific beliefs of the time. If you remember from the previous screencast, we talked about Bishop Usher, who said that the earth was only 4,000 years ago, and the common scientific belief was is that God created all creatures exactly the way they are now. So with Charles getting into the fold with his theory of evolution, he's basically going against the teaching of religion at the time, and he knew that that would be an issue, considering most scientists believe the... Uh, uh, the religious viewpoint. Now, he was also had a degree in theology, so he really understood the religious a aspect. And so he was kind of stunned and a little bit disturbed by it. Now, he wasn't going to be the greatest preacher in the world, but he still understood why people believed the things that they did. And therefore, he knew it would create a firestorm of opposition, and he actually was correct. <clears throat> This gentleman that he knew, was actually a colleague of his, Alfred Wallace, another scientist, had sent Charles a letter. And in this letter, he was telling Charles that, hey, I've been doing this research in Southeast Asia. Think of like Vietnam, Laos, that area. And I'm starting to come up with this idea that things are pretty well adapted to their environment. They must have changed over time. There's this natural selective kind of pressure. And, and Charles reading this and he's like, oh, my goodness. This guy has the exact same idea that I've had in my head for 20 years. Now, that told Charles he better get on it. If he wants credit for this great scientific theory, he needs to present all of his work. And he got to work and finished his book, which would be called The Origin of Species. And actually what happened was that he and Alfred Wallace presented their theory together at a science conference, but because... Charles was a little bit more articulate in explaining it. He had 20 years worth of data to um, support the idea. Charles is the one that gets all the credit, and poor Alfred is more or less a footnote on history on that one. All right, the name of Charles Darwin's famous book is called The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, as you see here on red. Most people refer to it as The Origin of Species for short. Now, this was published in 1859, which is around 154 years ago. The very first printing sold out within hours of the first day. And it's currently one of the top-selling books in the world. In fact, if you go to Amazon.com, its selling rank is 4,868. Now, considering there's over 800,000 different book titles on Amazon.com, that puts this book in the top 1% of the selling books up there. So it's not a New York Times bestseller, but it's a steady seller every year, every day for the last 154 years. <clears throat> All right, now, let's get into his theory. It starts with what is called inherited variation. And what this simply is, 
is that there is a range of phenotypes within a population. So if you look around in your own classroom, you're going to see everybody looks different. Some are tall, some are short, uh, some have brown hair, some have red hair, some have blue eyes, some have green eyes. There's this tremendous variation with any kind of population. Now, nature will begin to select which of those variations are going to be the most fit. We're going to go over those concepts later. All right? Now, Darwin was also very well aware of a concept called artif artificial selection. And this is a, um, a process where human beings choose which of the natural variations are going to be passed on to the next generation. Okay, They've done this whenever humans have always done agriculture. They've selectively bred uh, the plants they want to grow. They've selectively bred livestock. Maybe they give out more milk or they have more meat, etc. Now, the traits that humans choose do not actually improve fitness. Now, fitness is a concept that you're going to hear a ton in our evolutionary screencast, and fitness is defined right here. So I want you to make a little note that you need to know what this word means. Fitness is defined as the ability to survive and reproduce. All right? So in nature, the winners get a pass on their genes to the next generation. All right, so here's an example of Nash, or I'm sorry, of artificial selection in action. Think of your dog, or, or just all the dog breeds. Um, recently, I think we've had the uh, the Westminster uh, uh, Kennel Club show in New York City, where you see all the different varieties of dogs, and the dog actually comes from the wolf. Right, and even in a wolf population, you're going to see all these different varieties. Some are gray, some are brown, some are black, but you know, generally the wolf has a particular shape and in size and etc. Now, from this or a wolf, we get all these crazy dog breeds. So like here on the screen, you can see a British Bulldog with the flat face and the stubby legs and the very thick chest. I mean, that's not what a, a wolf looks like. And here you got a Dachshund. Looks like a little hot dog with little stubby legs. And then here's the Beagle, one of my favorite dogs, Doverman Pincher. And then obviously this is Dalmatian, totally different set of traits. So as you can see, human beings selected some wolves that had short legs and selected some wolves who had a long snout and then would select a dog that would have spots and breed those together to get more dogs with spots. That's how uh, artificial selection occurs. This is how you get the different breeds of dogs, cats, cattle, horses, etc. Okay? All right, we're going to stop this episode here. Our next episode is going to continue on how does Darwin's theory actually work. So until the next time, we'll catch you on the flip side.